Hello, and welcome to Best Colleges Emerging Trends in Online Education webinar. We're so excited to have you here with us. My name is Quinn Tomlin. I'm a member of our marketing team here at Best Colleges, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Jeff Braislin, and report author, Dr. Melissa Venable. A quick note, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available to download on our site in the coming days. There will also be time for questions at the end of the webinar, so please submit them as we go along in the questions box in the lower right-hand side of the webinar window. We will address as many as time allows when Melissa is done presenting. To begin today, I wanted to take a minute and tell you a bit about Best Colleges and why we produce our trend support. At Best Colleges, we believe education should be a pathway, never a barrier, and we're committed to guiding future alumni through the college planning process and supporting them on their way to new degrees, new careers, and new lives. We understand that online education is an integral part of this journey for many of our learners, especially those looking to change or move up in their careers. As the demand for online education has grown and more schools bring programs online, we've seen just how important it is to uphold the high standards of education that students can depend upon when making their college choice. This is why we began our annual online trends in education report to monitor and provide insight into the ever-changing industry of online higher education for both educators and the students they serve. The more clarity and information, like pain points and motivation, both sides have about the industry and each other, the better educators can build highly impactful programs and students can trust that they're receiving education suited to meet their needs. Our fifth annual report is now live and can be downloaded at www.bestcolleges.com and we will email out a link to you after the webinar. Before we get into the report's findings, Jeff Braislin is here to go over some of the macro trends we're seeing in higher education. Jeff? Great. Thank you, Quinn. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining today. We're excited to have you here. Um, we have a lot of great information to share with you, um, and we're very lucky to have Melissa with us today as well, who is the author of the report. And what we'll be covering today, is, as Quinn mentioned, we'll start by really taking a look at the current state of online education to really set the stage. And then from there, we'll, talk, we'll start talking more specifically about the trends report. Um, what, what is our approach? How do we look at it? And how do we think about really getting an accurate read of the pulse of both students and colleges? Then we'll talk to you about who we surveyed, the demographics and the audience breakdowns, what those look like. And then we'll actually dive in and really go um, into the meat of the presentation, presentation, which is understanding what are the key emerging trends in online education? What are the things that's propelling it forward? And then from there, we'll close out talking about how you can leverage those trends um, to develop your own online programs. So without further delay, we'll dive in here. So one of the first macro trends that we're seeing um, and has been observed is, is, is continued growth in um, distance enrollment. What we saw in 2017 from Babson was an increase in 5.6% of distance enrollment. That's an increase of over 300,000 students. And what's more is this has accelerated over the three years pr uh, previous. So the, the takeaway from this is uh, distance learning is growing, it's accelerating, and we'll talk about some of those reasons today. Another part of this is what's driving um, uh, behind what's driving behind the adoption of online education. And what we're seeing is that public institutions are, are really the uh, largest portions of the universities pushing for these online learners. So that's really, really where it's concentrated right now. Roughly 67.8% of distance learners are attending public institutions. So th those are the key drivers. Um, oftentimes, this can be a mix of online only or it could be a mix of campus and online, but regardless, this is where the growth is coming from. And then our last macro trend here is the enrollments are on the rise. Almost half of the distance education students are concentrated in just 5% of the institutions. So what we're seeing here is not just is it from the public institutions, but it's a few core institutions that are really responsible for leading the charge. So it's highly concentrated. Um, but we'll see how that goes over time. Um, I think we'll talk a little bit more about the diversification of this in some of our next webinars of, of how schools continue to find ways to take advantage um, of these trends. So with that said, that brings us to the uh, online education trend report findings. Um, and with that, I will introduce Melissa. Uh, we're very lucky to have Melissa with us today. Um, she has served as an online education advisor and writer at Best Colleges in Higher Education. She is also an adjunct instructor and course designer at St. Leo University and the University of South Florida. Um, and an independent contractor, Design Doc LLC. So, uh, Melissa, this is the fifth, fifth time she's really kind of 
led the charge on this report here at Best Colleges. And so we're very excited to have her today for her to walk you through the approach and findings. Um, and as mentioned, as you have questions, please submit them and we'll get to them as time allows. With I'm gonna hand the uh, controls over to you here. Thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate that very kind introduction. Uh, this initiative has been a team effort from the very beginning. So I'm happy to, to be a part of it and, uh, and to lead the charge here in the presentation. Let me uh, get the presentation in full swing here. And hopefully you can see my screen, okay. Um, this is our third year of the five years of the initiative in collecting original data. And that's uh, starting to allow us to collect some longer term trends uh, related to three main areas. So we're looking at um, online learners themselves. Who are they? Uh, why are they choosing online? Um, what are their characteristics? We also want to do a dive every year with our data collection into online program marketing and recruitment. What resources are students using to find the schools that they're going to apply to and enroll in? Um, and what kind of information uh, do they need uh, when, they, when they go to those sources? Um, and then lastly, the last group of trends we'll look at um, have to do with program design and development. And what compels a, a school to decide that it's time to add a new online program? It's certainly not a small uh, undertaking. And so we want to get at what are some of the, the considerations on uh, some of the decisions that are made and some of the challenges um, of that process. Our full report, as Quinn mentioned, is available online. And I absolutely encourage you to go take a look at that. And uh, happy to follow up with you after the webinar and any questions you have on the full report. Today, we're going to offer some highlights in these three um, trend areas. So to start off a little bit with methodology, we did two separate surveys um, and we did these in January and February of the year, all self-reported data. We were able to get feedback from 451 schools this year and from 1,500 students who represent those who are currently enrolled in online programs, those who are seriously considering enrolling in online programs, as well as those who have graduated from online programs. So let's talk a little bit more about each of these groups. Uh, the first group, our school administrators, um, report that they are almost entirely uh, from nonprofit institutions, and a little more than half, 60%, are from four year institutions. Um, they reported their primary uh, job titles to us, as we all know, many people wear many hats <laughs> working on campus. Uh, and these are the three that, that have come up the last. Um, the last two years that we've asked the question about job titles. So we're looking at leadership positions here in academics, uh, in administration, as well as in enrollment admissions. Our students, again, 1,500 students, uh, and we have a lot more information about their demographic uh, categories and breakdowns in the full report. But just to give you a quick peek uh, today during the session, you can see the gender breakdown, a few more female than male, um, the enrollment status of those responding, slightly more than half full-time students, uh, and a little more than half also reporting that they're in undergraduate programs. Again, if you want to find out more about their majors, um, their marital status, their employment status, racial, ethnic backgrounds and income levels. We've got all that for you in the full report. All right, so digging into our three areas of trends, um, starting with student demographics. Uh, it probably comes as no surprise to you that students that choose online education, as well as those that choose higher education in general, are often driven by motives that have career and employment uh, in mind. They, they want to enter a, a career for the first time. They want to potentially switch careers or working professionals that have an, an, another industry that they'd like to move into, or their career accelerators, who are the ones that um, they're working already and they want to advance and get promoted in those fields where they already have some experience. So this year, uh, for the first time, we saw the majority of those career-oriented students identify themselves as career accelerators, which we think is interesting. 69% um, of the students overall identified those career goals as, as a reason why they were in online programs. Uh, we also um, asked uh, schools a little bit about the, the motives and, and what the kind of information the students are looking for when they contact them. And 80% of them said that uh, students that contact them about their programs before enrolling are looking for placement employment type data. So again, you can see that focus of those students that are, that are enrolling. Um, our second uh, trend in this category has to do with uh, diversity and in a lot of ways. Um, are online students getting older or younger? Uh, this year we heard both. Uh, last year our, in our report we, we had kind of an aha moment and then a, a number of schools reported that, that their students were getting younger, either right out of high school 
or even concurrently enrolled in college credits online while they were finishing high school to get a kind of get a leg up on um, moving toward a degree once they graduated from high school. So in our question to the schools of, you know, what demographic trends are you seeing? Age was kind of an interesting one this year and that we saw it going in both directions a little bit, older and younger students joining in. Um, we also saw some interesting uh, feedback with location. We had some schools share that they're having more enrollment from outside the U.S., international locations, uh, from geographic areas of the U.S. outside of where their campus is located. Uh, but then we also saw the flip of that. Other schools saying, nope, we're seeing more students um, from a hyper-local area, right? Or they live right in town, right where campus is, and they're choosing online programs. Um, and then they were also seeing, and we'll talk about this more in a moment as well, um, schools reporting that they're on campus resident students are choosing to take an online class or two uh, to, to move forward in their degree programs. The third area of diversity here covers a, a range. When we think of diversity, we think of things like um, underrepresented, under, underrepresented minorities, lower income students, first generation students. Schools are saying, yes, we're seeing more of that, but they're also seeing more students with um, disabilities. They're also seeing more students with English, English as a second language type um, needs for, for support and assistance. We asked uh, the students several questions about their online learning experience. Um, why do they choose online and not on campus? Well, for the third year in a row, that convenience and flexibility, which we always hear about and we always know is uh, a benefit of, of choosing online, it tops the reasons why they're there. But we are seeing also some input from students in that um, campus is playing a, a bit of a role in, in their online program. So 46% of students said that they visit campus um, either because they want to, there's some sort of facility or service that they want to go um, check into, or because it's some sort of a requirement that they have. And our examples in the survey there were if they had tutoring or proctor testing or something like that would be that might be required on campus. Um, I have a quote here, that second bullet from one of our school respondents um, that that made that note again about the resident students, on-campus students taking online courses uh, to supplement what they're already doing and reduce the time to graduation. That really does seem to be a trend um, that's coming through pretty well. Let's move on now to our next uh, category of trends, which has to do with program marketing and recruitment. Um, what resources are students using to decide on a program and, and what are their biggest challenges that they're reporting when they're, when they're making a decision about which program they'll attend or which one they'll, they'll actually enroll in? Um, for three years in a row, without any variation, uh, the top two challenges listed to making a decision about online education are one, estimating actual costs, and two, finding financial aid, navigating that whole financial aid process, finding all the funding that they need um, to enroll and, and be able to pay for college. Uh, we also asked our online graduates, there are online alumni, um, what would they do differently? What were their lessons learned if they were going to enroll in online programs again? And without fail, the top two answers every year are they would have compared more programs and they would have done more research about costs and financial aid. And that cost and financial aid, this is going to, you're going to hear more about that before, before I'm done today, but those are real considerations in their, in their decision making about a school. Uh, when we ask them where they go to look for this information, where do they go to research and compare programs, 20% uh, said they contact schools directly. Um, so that was the largest uh, percentage of, of response there, uh, followed by um, online reviews. And we're certainly, none of us is probably a stranger to an online review. When you go to make a purchase, you, you look to see what other people have said about it. And students are doing that with sites like Grad Reports and Unigo, and there are, there are a couple of others out there uh, where students can go in and, and provide their feedback. And then the third reason, uh, the third uh, top way why the, the researching programs has to do with using rankings websites, and you all are probably very familiar with those as well. well also in this section, this section we want to talk about um, demand for online education um, and perception of demand more specifically. Uh, we ask our school administrators uh, every year, you know, what do they think the demand is like now? What do they think it's going to be like in the future. Um, and it's this has been a very steady uh, feedback point in which they are telling us it's steady. As you can see there, 99% whopping overwhelming majority say that demand is either increasing or has stayed the same. And that's what we've heard for um, three years in a row now. Moving into online program design and development. Uh, I mentioned before, and this is, not a, this is not a small decision to decide, okay, we need to add a new program and it needs to be online. There's a lot to think about. Um, so what's the primary motive? You know, what is the factor that's really driving this? And school administrators had these two top 
um, responses that we wanted to share with you today. The first off is that um, it's a response to student demand. They've, they've either done the, the, the research or they've, they've got some other feedback that's telling them students um, want or, or need this program and will enroll um, when, when we get there. Um, and then 71% said that those new programs are launched um, as a way to, to, to grow the, the college, grow the university, and to um, certainly increase um, overall student enrollment. Uh, so with that being said, we asked, okay, so those are your primary factors for, for, for launching. Um, what are your biggest concerns with a new launch? And you'll see here the top two are marketing and meeting recruitment goals. Um, as well as meeting cost and management demands. And management demands, uh, we used a couple of examples in the survey there that were things like faculty development, um, help desk, admin functions, all the things that it takes to operate um, and run a successful online program. So you can see here with, with this feedback, there's a recognition that there's a student-driven demand, but also uh, a realization that it may be a daunting task to, to bring those students to the program, to get them recruited and get them in. Uh, the last trend in this section um, has to do with roadblocks to graduation. And we asked the students and the schools, you know, you know students, what is the biggest roadblock um, once you're enrolled? How, what's the biggest thing getting in your way to, to reaching graduation and, and successful um, finishing your program? And 20% uh, of the, those that graduated um, said, that it was life events, uh, unexpected circumstances, events in the personal life. Things come up, life happens um, for all of us. When we asked uh, the administrators, you know, what's the, the biggest challenge that your students are facing? 40% of those um, said the, the same thing, unexpected circumstances and, and, and life events. Um, this may not be a surprise either. Online students are very busy students. A lot of times they're choosing online because they wanna continue to work. Um, they have families um, or a, a myriad of reasons. Um, they've got a lot of things that they're trying to balance in their lives. Um, there are implications here for student support at the course level and program level um, that can be built into design and development. Um, when we have a short academic, academic term, which many online uh, courses are, I know I've taught in as few as uh, six weeks. I know there are five-week courses out there. Um, if, if something happens, whether it's a death in the family or a natural disaster or, or something happy like a birth or a marriage, I've had students get married in the middle of the class, um, change jobs, all these things kind of they present kind of a hiccup um, in, the, in the class schedule. And if you get behind a week or, or two weeks, then it's really difficult um, to, get, to, keep, to keep moving forward. Overall, with all of the benefits and all the challenges um, that we've discussed so far, student satisfaction looks to us to be quite high. This year, we looked at student satisfaction through sort of three lenses, we're calling them. Um, one is their perception of ROI, um, return on investment of their, their time and work and, and resources they put into their programs. Um, would they be willing to recommend it to others? And then what is their um, overall perceived value of the academic quality of the online programs? And, Overwhelmingly positive here. You can see this year, 77% of students said they felt like their online programs are, are better than or are equal to on-campus options. 88% um, feel like they are already seeing uh, parts of R or they will once they graduate. And then 89% saying they would certainly recommend online learning to others. All right, so that's a, that's kind of a lot. Um, so what are the takeaways there? You know, what do we what do we think might be um, helpful uses and applications for for that information? And certainly, again, more uh, in our full report. So we've got five things that we want to tell you about here as you reflect on um, where you are with your online programs and what you may be thinking about for the future. Um, that we hope will will help you to to take this data and, and use it in ways that'll be helpful for you. First off, that diversity factor. Um, it, for a while now, um, you know, we've been saying that the typical online student is not so typical, but I think we're really starting to see how diverse that online student might be with that age range moving out in both directions, um, locations kind of all over the place, um, and all kinds of other needs that maybe we're not as aware of or taking into consideration, um, like the disabilities and English second language. Um, finances are, are a huge piece for college um, in all aspects, and we're seeing that with online students that that's a big issue as well, and with lots of in lower income students, first generation students, it can be a real challenge. So again, a lot of implications here for student support services as well as faculty development. I mean, you, you could potentially, depending on the program and you know what you're offering and the students that you're reaching, you could have an online course that has a, a recent high school graduate or 
uh, a student that's still in high school and, and taking some college credit online in, in class working uh, online with professionals that have been working for, for years um, <laughs> in, in the field. So when you think about things like discussion forums and how to design and get those uh, put in, how to facilitate um, that, what content is gonna make sense for a, a diverse group of students that, that takes some planning and certainly part of that design and uh, development uh, stage. Secondly, um, what can we all do? Um, it's our, certainly our goal, and uh, this report helps us to, to get a, a little bit of a handle on, on what, what are students looking for and what is it that they need um, when they're looking for online education. So going where they are, uh, they are they've, they've told us they are um, contacting schools directly, they are using review sites, and they are using ranking sites. So for your, for your, for your institutions, when students come, prospective students uh, contact you directly, what does that mean? Um, where are they finding and how are they finding the information that they need? And what we're seeing that they need are things on actual costs, uh, financial aid support and navigation of the process, and then ways to really compare programs. And often it's comparing apples and oranges, but you know, how do we help them um, through that process so that they set realistic expectations for what it's going to be financially, academically, um, and otherwise. Um, uh, not on this slide, but sort of secondarily here, uh, some of our students uh, replied that one of the things they wish they had done was to talk to more people um, before they had enrolled. So that could be um, alumni, it could be current students, it could be employers that have hired your students, ways to connect them so that they are finding the best fit. You want them to be in the best fit uh, right off the bat so to get that success uh, towards graduation, uh, even, even better shot. Number three, um, the career development piece here. Um, looking at what the students need from that uh, prospective student stage where they have career goals in mind and they, and they want to enroll, expecting a certain employment outcome, um, to those who have just graduated or, or have graduated but are, are maybe need uh, retraining or want to move forward, their career accelerators that may come back to get an advanced degree with you, how can you support that, that career development journey um, in lots of ways? Uh, Career services, you, you have those services there. How are internships, networking, employer partnerships, um, are they built in um, to your design and development? Are, are there ways that, that students are encouraged uh, to work with these groups? Um, how can they be better integrated than they may be now? Um, and again, helping students to be in contact with the people that are gonna help them move forward after graduation. Number four, finances, right? I sound like a broken record on this one, I know. Um, very strong, we've received such strong feedback from our student surveys, all three years of data collection, that you know, not only is, is, is this a concern when they're making a decision, but it's also a challenge when they um, go to, to move through their program. So after enrollment, that, that first big challenge is, is that life problem, right? Life happens. The second one is, is continuing to pay for school. Um, so, how do we get students through year from year to year, term to term? Do they know what the expectations are for, from their role? What do they need to do to um, monitor their own situation, potentially apply or reapply for the assistance that they're getting, um, and to prepare for whatever that loan repayment might be after um, they graduate if they are taking on personal loans to, to complete their programs. And our last uh, recommendation, um, as you look at your School, we invite you to look closely at your, your specific students and across programs. You may have very different demographics in your different programs, undergraduate, graduate, by subject area, et cetera. We've given you an overview of what we think it looks like nationally. Um, what do your students look like and how do they compare to that? So doing some investigation, if you're not already, which you may very well be, into what their characteristics are, what their perceptions are, um, what do they need, what would they do differently, um, what would they recommend um, that may give you some marketing and recruitment um, motivation and, and material to work with as well? And at this point, I'll conclude and turn it back over to Jeff. All right. So now uh, we're going to go ahead and open it up for question and answer. So if you have any questions, um, if you haven't submitted them already, please do so. Um, we do have a few to get started here. And so Quinn is going to uh, moderate uh, here with Melissa. Excellent. Thank you so much, Melissa, for that great breakdown of this year's findings. Um, we do have a few questions that have been sent in, but you can still uh, send them in through the questions box, or if that's not working for you, through the chat as well. Um, we'll pull from both those places. So the first question that we have, um, Melissa is asking, what is your take on the future of online education? Do you think that it will overtake on-campus learning eventually? 
Well, that's a really helpful question, and I think a lot of people are asking that, right? Especially as you think about um, if you're on a campus where you're you're balancing budgets uh, for on ground and online stuff. Um, I don't think online will overtake. However, I do think they are becoming more integrated and intertwined. And we're seeing a lot of movement and really positive research out there with other reports and other initiatives that are taking place about blended learning, um, which has long been billed as, um, quote unquote, the best of both worlds. And I think that may be what's, what we're moving toward um, as an industry. Um, uh, also, you know, over the past uh, three years that we've been collecting um, information from students, we have seen a gradual um, decrease every year in the percentage of students that say they never visit campus as online students, so if that makes sense. Um, so more are choosing to visit campus even if they don't need to. Um, and we're also seeing um, an increase in the number of students who are choosing to take both online and on-campus courses. Um, so creating kind of their own hybrid version of, of what their program might be. And I know some schools are really encouraging that. Um, and it's becoming more of an option. Again, we heard from our schools this time about the resident students or it seemed to be a growing enrollment um, group in their online uh, courses. Uh, we're also um, seeing, it, this will be in the report, but it was not in our presentation, an increase uh, of students who are reporting that they have live synchronous uh, requirements in their online classes. So not uh, in person physically, but in, in their in virtual rooms at the same time, um, scheduled events um, interacting there in much in similar ways that they might in a, in a physical classroom. So um, that best of both worlds may be where we're headed. Excellent, thank you, Melissa. Um, another question we just got says, you said that schools see an ongoing demand for online programs, but what subject areas do you think will be most in demand? Are we seeing any trends there, Melissa? Oh, right, majors, right? Which, <laughs> which majors, that's like, uh, that's a really great, that's certainly a wonderful question. Um, and certainly um, something that uh, some other reports out there really focus solely on. We do have a few questions. It's not a major focus of our work, um, but we did ask uh, school administrators to, to weigh in on what their thoughts are for the next five years uh, or so. And the top three areas uh, that came through um, this year are uh, healthcare related uh, majors, followed by business uh, related, uh, followed by computer science related. Um, uh, last year, I think our number four, that was the same list for three, the top three. Last year, our number four was education related, but that one moved down a little bit this year. And I'm trying to remember what number four was this year. And I can't remember, but it is certainly, it is certainly in that, um, that full report. Excellent. Well, it looks like we have time for one more question. Um, I'm gonna say, you mentioned challenges related to paying for college several times. Why do you think this continues to be a problem? Is it student loans or something else? Uh, hmm. um, again, a helpful question because it, do, it does, it is, they're, they're really telling us, um, I feel very strongly um, in our survey every year that this is something that we, we think, we may think we're getting to the, the crux of, but it doesn't seem like that's maybe necessarily the case. Um, uh, this year in our in our student respondents, uh, I mentioned household uh, income level earlier. You can check that the full demographic list on that. But over half um, of our students said that they are in one of the two lower um, income levels that our, our survey um, group uses. So under forty nine thousand dollars a year household income. So college is expensive, and uh, if you have that one uh, unexpected life event, and you're already struggling with you know finances across the board with, with work and family and everything else, then school may, may become less of a priority and certainly it pres presents a roadblock um, to graduation. Uh, there are a lot of variables to consider in finances and I think, um, and how students pay for college and, and many are relying on multiple uh, sources, um, not just financial aid, not just loans. Um, we do have one question in our survey where we ask, uh, you know, how are they paying for college? Um, and we are getting that, it's a big mix of things. It includes um, personal savings and, and family members. So um, finances are, are, are always tight um, and we certainly are seeing that among our college students. Um, how, do, how, do we, how do we address this and, and being more aware of it um, and being more um, in contact and, and looking at students as individuals and kind of helping to, them to figure out what they need and then helping them to plan so that they're making good decisions while they're students in that temporary time before graduation that they're ready to, to hit the ground running um, with realistic salary expectations and they know what their loan payoff uh, terms and all that's gonna be when they graduate. 
Excellent. Well, thank you, Melissa. Um, if we did not get to your question uh, live today, we will be sure to follow up directly with email. Um, you can expect that later today or tomorrow. And we want to remind you to stay connected with Best Colleges. You can find us on social media at bestcolleges.com or on the web at www.bestcolleges.com. And we will be following up shortly with the recording of this webinar. So you can share it with your colleagues as well as the PDF of the report. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Quinn. And look for more webinars coming from us and Best Colleges here in the future. Thank you. Thank you.